In this video, I'll demonstrate how to validate a typical ELISA protocol and how you may want to structure your acceptability criteria. Each ELISA is different, and each laboratory will use their own criteria to validate their runs. Some common criteria for assay validation include control sample values, correlation coefficients, precision and accuracy of your standards, as well as recording additional parameters to help with troubleshooting when necessary. Standard samples, or calibrators, are the samples with known concentrations and are used as the ruler for your assay. By using known values for your standard concentrations, the concentration values of your control and unknown samples can be interpolated by fitting a curve to the plotted raw values of your standards. The goal of validating your assay is to make sure an inch really is an inch on your ruler. Standard accuracy and precision are also important indicators of assay validity. If your standard precision and accuracy are not within the expected limits, it could be indicative of a sample preparation error, and inaccurate calibrators could lead to incorrect sample interpolation and spurious results. Often, each assay will have defined acceptable limits for precision and accuracy. The measure of precision will often be percent CV, or the coefficient of variance. The higher the percent CV, the more variance between replicates. To measure the accuracy, you may look at the percent accuracy or the percent difference. This will measure how much the obtained concentration differs from the theoretical or defined concentration. If these values are too disparate, it could be indicative of a poor fit or a sample preparation error. Either way, poor standard accuracy can result in inaccurate sample concentrations. So how can you determine what a good threshold should be for accuracy and precision limits? Often the manufacturer will define an acceptable limit within the kit insert, but if they don't, you can set your own. A good rule of thumb is to use any included inter and intra assay precision data included in the kit insert. This data is included in the insert to demonstrate how the assay normally performs. If, for instance, the manufacturer reported five samples run across 20 different runs, and return percent CVs between 3 and 11, and within a single run, percent CVs between 4 and 7, a good starting point might be setting a 10 or 15 percent CV limit for your sample replicates. Using a goodness of fit measure can help you determine how well your standards fit the defined curve fit method. My assays desktop offers many options for goodness measures. Choosing the most appropriate one will depend on your laboratory's requirements as well as the assay you're running. A commonly used goodness measure is the R-squared. This is a relatively simple goodness measure, where the closer to 1, the better the fit. Setting a limit for your R-squared can be helpful, maybe only accepting runs with an R-squared greater than 0.985. Control samples are samples that have known concentrations. They're typically included on your run, and by examining the mean and standard deviation of these samples, you can ensure that the assay has been performed correctly. Control samples may be included with your assay kit, but if they aren't, it's usually recommended to create control samples in-house. You can do this by pooling previously assayed matrix samples that are close to the desired range, then creating aliquots and assaying a number of times, usually at least 20 replicates, to identify the mean and standard deviation. It's important to not only look at control samples on the current run, but also the results from previous assay runs. It's recommended to use a quality control software, like the functionality available in My Assays Desktop. This will allow you to keep track of your control samples. You can then apply rules like WestGuard rules to make sure your controls don't show any significant shifts or trends. Your lab may also define your own criteria for quality control, but regardless of which rules you use, your control data should be reviewed often and adjusted as needed. Let's look at these parameters in a couple of real-life examples. A typical ELISA may contain a blank correction, a standard curve fit, and if your samples are run in multiple replicates, often the percent CV will be calculated. Looking at my report, the first thing I'll do is check my curve chart and make sure the curve looks good. By looking at the chart, you can identify any obvious outliers or if the general nature of your curve isn't as expected. For example, if my assay is a competitive ELISA, I would expect the optical density to be inversely proportional to the concentration, so a high OD would correspond to a low concentration. However, if I find in my curve that this is not the case, it would be cause for additional investigation. 
Next, I'll briefly look at my results. I just want to check to make sure that most of my results are within the range of the standard curve and that there's a pretty good spread of my results. If all of my results were outside of the standard range, or if my results were skewed to one side of the curve, I would be prompted to investigate and review my protocol for procedural errors. I've used a couple different settings here to make it easier to visualize my results. I've used a color scheme on my final concentrations, highlighting the highest results in red and the lowest results in green, with those in the middle appearing with no color. This way, when I scroll through my report, I can see an approximate spread of my results, which in this case is around 400 down to about 12. I've also elected to include my unknown and control samples on my standard curve fit chart. This gives me an immediate overview of how my unknowns are distributed across my curve. I'll also check the percent CVs for each of my samples. A high percent CV between the replicates of the same sample group may return an inaccurate result, so these samples should be repeated. If all or the majority of your samples show high percent CVs, this could be indicative of improper reagent addition or an issue with the wash step. On the fit details sheet, I can review my calibrators table. This table displays the standards from our assay, along with their positions, defined concentrations, blank corrected optical densities, and their average, the calculated concentrations, and the percent CV, which you'll remember is a measure of precision, and the percent accuracy. You'll notice the rows are either highlighted in light red or in olive, and this corresponds to whether or not the precision or accuracy meet the quantification limits we've set in the standard curve fit tab. You can adjust those settings under the Properties control on the Transform tab by clicking on the standard curve fit transform and scrolling down to the quantification limits. On the Fit tab, we can also see the Goodness Measures table. For example, if we've chosen only to accept runs with an R-squared of 0.985 or greater, we could find that information on this table. And you can see that this run has an acceptable R-squared of 0.989 approximately. You could also choose to set up an evaluations table to report these values or a validations table to report whether or not the results are acceptable. For more information on evaluations and validations, please see the associated videos. You could also choose to record additional parameters from the assay to be used in a troubleshooting capacity. For instance, you could record the parameters used in your curve, the limits of quantification, or your blank ODs. This could be useful if, for example, you have a string of run failures and you notice your blank results are much higher than they normally are. This could be indicative of an issue with one of your reagents or an issue with contamination. On our QC tab, we can see our Levy Jennings chart displaying the results of control one across our runs. I've set this up using the quality control settings. So for more information on how to use this functionality, please see the associated video. By using the data displayed in this chart, I can ensure my control values stay in range. The black line indicates the mean. The first two dashed lines show one standard deviation from the mean, and the second two dashed lines show two standard deviations. You can change these limits under the quality control settings and include a line for three standard deviations if desired. And using this chart, we can apply WestGuard rules or whatever other rules your laboratory has defined to ensure your assay stays in control and any shifts or trends in the quality control data are appropriately investigated. So you can see that all but one of our observations were within two SDs. Based on everything we've looked at for this run, I would accept it as valid. I have another set of data to analyze, so let's go ahead and import that data. and calculate our results. So now when I look at my report, I see a pretty good fit and I see a good distribution of my unknowns. However, I notice a big issue right off that my curve does not follow the expected pattern. Normally with this assay, the optical densities are inversely proportional to the defined concentration. And with this data set, I can see that the lower concentration also has a lower optical density. So this would prompt me to investigate my plate layout or assay procedure. And if I go straight to my QC tab, I can see that there's an issue because this observation of my control is obviously much lower than the others. So although my fit looks pretty good, and we can see that the R squared value is acceptable, I would not accept this run as valid. Let's look at another data set. So I'll again enter my measurements and calculate my results. 
Now with this data set, we can see that the calibrator data definitely follows the correct pattern for the assay, but it looks like my unknowns are all clustered into this portion of the curve. It looks like my highest concentrations are only around 100. Our R squared is good if we look at the fit details, but on our QC chart, we can see that again, the control is less than two SDs. Now, just because my unknowns are all low or high doesn't immediately mean we should fail this run. Maybe we're running a reference range study and are assaying only samples from a specific subset of maybe age or gender that would cause us to expect our results all to be on one side of the range. But because my control is also outside the acceptable limits, I would go ahead and fail and repeat this run. Let's look at one last data set. Looking at this data set, the curve looks okay. The unknowns appear to be pretty evenly spread across the range of the standards. When I look at the results, however, I can see that there is a consistent low level of precision across my plate. A lot of my results show a high percent CV, and when I look at my standards chart on the fit details sheet, I can see that they also show a relatively low level of precision. Even though my R squared is acceptable and my control is in range, I would probably elect to fail this plate and repeat the run. Issues with imprecision like this can often be attributed to the wash step or reagent addition. So if, for example, I had used an automatic plate washer, I would go ahead and inspect each nozzle or needle to ensure it's dispensing and aspirating correctly and maybe perform a dispensing device check. I'd also check any pipettes used to perform my assay, including multi-channel pipettes used for reagent addition, to make sure they're consistently dispensing the appropriate amount of reagent. So by evaluating several different parameters, we can make sure our assay remains in control and that the results reported are accurate. It's important to remember that no one parameter will automatically validate your assay, but by considering multiple factors, you can be confident you're reporting high quality results. If you have any questions about assay validation, please email us at support at myassays.com.